Hello everyone, before we get this started, when I say this, I mean this episode, I just have to say that I recorded this episode before the Spotify wrapped list came out, and I just have to say like, thank you so much for all of the support throughout the year, I really do appreciate it, I love to see the fact that a lot of people like to support this podcast and you love it as much as I do, Um, if you'd like for me to see how or like how your spotify wrapped actually came out well then you can just tag me on instagram on twitter basically anywhere the link will be in the description but i just wanted to say thank you so much for all of the love and support i really do love you and let us just continue this energy into 2023 Welcome, welcome back to A Crash Investigation, the podcast, the show where we dissect and discuss primary crashes in aviation history. I'm your host, as always, Kai Jordan, and in today's episode, we are going to be talking about how a false stall warning led to the crash of Kenya Airways Flight 431 and how it killed over 200 people. So before we continue, of course, don't forget to like us on the podcast platform that you're listening to us on um check out our links check out our patreon buy me a coffee instagram twitter basically everything all of those links will be in the description box below in a link three link so don't be afraid to click on it i promise you i won't scam you but without wasting any more of your time because i feel like this one is going to be a really long episode let us officially get started it is the greatest aviation mystery of all time lies a massive passenger jet and the remains of its 239 passengers and crew uh, good morning we have uh, a smoke uh, uh, problem and we're doing emergency descent to level 15140. In December 1988, a passenger airliner was bombed over Scotland in what was one of the largest pre-9-11 terrorist attacks. Kenya Airways Flight 431 was a scheduled flight for the 30th of January 2000. The origin was Felix Houphouët Bonnui International Airport, Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. I apologize. I tried my best. Its destination was Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, Nairobi, Kenya, and the stopover was Murtala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, Nigeria. The aircraft used was the Airbus A310. Dash 304 and the call sign was Kenya 431. The captain of this flight was Paul Muti, who was 44 years old at the time of the crash, and I quote, he had an air transport pilot's license or ATPL issued on 10 August 1988 in Nairobi, renewed on 10 November 1999, and valid until 17 June 2000. Medical certificate issued on 29 November 1999 and valid until 17 June 2000. Main type ratings Piper 31, Piper 34, Cessna 402, DHC 6, Twin Otter, Fakha 27, Fakha 50, Boeing 737-200, Boeing 737-300 and Airbus 310. A310 type rating obtained on 10 August 1986 within Kenya Airways. The conversion course that was of Airbus industry approved by by the Kenyan authorities. End quote. In total, Captain Muti had 11,636 total flight hours with 1,664 flight hours on the Airbus 310. The first officer of this flight was Lazaro Mutumbi Muli, who was 43 years old at the time of the crash. And I quote, he had an air transport pilot's license ATPL issued on 4 August 1999 in Nairobi and valid until 11 February 2000. Medical certificate issued on 4 August 1999 and valid until 11 February 2000. End quote. In total, he had 7,295 flight hours with 5,763 flight hours on the Airbus 310. 
there were seven flight attendants and a chief flight attendant meaning that there were eight flight attendants in total and they were qualified enough to deal with essentially a crash which is what we saw here with kenya airways in total there were 169 passengers on board now before the actual flight took place and if you want to see the final report then check out our patreon at patreon.com slash a crash investigation i just wanted to do a self plug right there sorry but back to your episode and i quote on 28 january 2000 all of the cabin crew had undertaken the nairobi lagos avijan flight and had flown for six hours and 10 minutes after a rest period of 52 hours and 45 minutes, they went on duty again to undertake flight KQ-431, aka Kenya Airways flight 431, Abidjan, Lagos, Nairobi, with a takeoff planned for 9 o'clock p.m., end quote. So maybe the people were tired, but they could not have been tired because they had 52 hours to rest. Well, let's see what happened with this flight. So the flight was scheduled to take off at 9 p.m. and the pilot flying would be first off Samuli. Then at 5 minutes to 9 p.m. the crew asked for startup clearance from the air traffic controller. The air traffic controller then grants their request. Then Captain Muti then instructs for the takeoff checklist to be completed. At 1 minute past 9 p.m. the crew then asks for clearance to taxi. The controller then puts the flight on standby for a few seconds and then they clear them to taxi down the runway. Then at 2 minutes past 9 p.m., Captain Muti then instructs first of Samuli to set the flaps as slats. And I quote, the aeroplane began to taxi at 7 minutes past 9 p.m., 35 seconds. The tower controller informed the crew of the latest wind, cleared them to take off and asked the crew the call back when they reached flight level 40. At 7 minutes past 9 p.m., 45 seconds, the co-pilot read back the clearance. This was the last communication between the crew and the control tower, end quote. At 8 minutes past 9 p.m., the flight starts to take off until the stall warning sounds. Uh-oh. At 9 minutes past 9 p.m., the automatic call out announced 300 feet or 91 meters. First of Samuli then asks, what's the problem? And I quote, from 9 minutes past 9 p.m., 16 seconds, the AC announced successfully 200, 100. 50, 30, 20, and 10 feet. Meanwhile, at 9 minutes past 9, 18 seconds, the co-pilot ordered the oral warning to be cut. Two seconds later, the GPWS, or Grand Proximity Warning System, sounded the whoop alarm a half a second later by the AC announcement of 50 feet. At 9 minutes past 9 p.m., 22 seconds, an oral master warning started, immediately followed by an order from the captain to climb, go up through this was preceded six tenths of a second by the ac announcement of 10 feet at nine minutes past 9 p.m 23,9 seconds end of the master warning followed immediately within a tenth of a second by the noise of impact end quote and unfortunately kenya airways flight 431 crashes two kilometers 1,2 miles or 1,1 nautical miles from the airport into the atlantic ocean all 169 passengers and including the cabin crew members died in this crash. So the meteorological conditions at Abidjan were as follows and I quote, From 8 o'clock p.m. to 12 a.m., the sky was clear with few clouds. Two out of eight strato Columbus with its base at between 350 and 400 meters. The horizontal visibility was good, equal to or over 8 kilometers. There was an absence of any rain or storm activity or any other meteorological phenomena at this time, meaning that the conditions definitely do not lead to this crash so the area of the wreckage site was follows and i quote the impact occurred 1,5 nautical miles from the abidjan runway on the atlantic ocean debris from the wreckage was spread over an area of 150 meters wide east to west by 450 meters long north to south at depths between 40 and 50 meters the wreckage came to a rest on the sandy seabed and was subject to a sea current from west to east end quote 
So now I'm going to read the important info in terms of the wreckage and I quote, the fin and half of the main landing gear were among the debris recovered on the surface on the beach. Films of the wreckage showed the following elements. A slat with its glide rail, a flap with its actuator screw jack, the trimmable stabilizer with the actuator screw jack, a landing gear assembly with its shock absorber, both engines, the cockpit center console, end quote. So, as you have heard, when I was essentially explaining the whole flight, there was a stall warning on board, and the investigators and the people who investigated this crash being the BEA of France, and the reason why you are wondering why the BEA of France was investigating this crash, even though it happened on Côte d'Ivoire soil, is because I think that Côte d'Ivoire essentially it was colonized by France, and therefore I think France still had some sort of influence on the country. Anyway, enough about that little history lesson. The BEA then was looking into possible scenarios as to what caused the stall, and we're going to go through some of them right now. Number one being the incorrect configuration of the aeroplane on takeoff, and I quote, he selected, he, I think they are talking about first of some yearly, but anyway, he selected flap or slat position announced by the crew before takeoff was 15 degrees by 15 degrees. If the flap or slats had been retracted during the takeoff row, the configuration warning alarm would have been set off. As no alarm ha is recorded on the CVR during this phase, this indicates that the aircraft took off with the flaps and slats in the 15 degrees, 15 degrees position. Further, observations of the wreckage showed that the position of one of the, the flaps was extended to 15 degrees. The slats or flaps control lever had only one position allowing the position with flaps extended to 15 degrees. Slats 15 degrees, flaps 15 degrees. Consequently, after the accident, the position of the flaps and slats was flaps 15 degrees, slats 15 degrees. The airplane configuration on takeoff was normal, flaps 15 degrees and slats 15 degrees, meaning that this did not contribute to the accident. Number two, the uncommanded slat retraction. So the reason why I think this is dangerous or why Google think that it's dangerous for slats to be retracted during takeoff is because when slats are retracted during during takeoff, it reduces the climb of the airplane, which then results in the airplane reducing lift and the airplane going down. So, and I quote, the selected flap slash slat announced by the crew before takeoff was 15 degrees, 15 degrees. If the slats or flaps had been retracted during takeoff row, the configuration warning would have sounded. Since no warning is recorded on the CVR during this phase, this indicates that the aircraft took off with the flaps and slats in the 15 degrees, 15 degrees position. Observations on the wreckage showed that the position of one of the flaps was extended to 15 degrees. The slats slash flaps control lever had only one position, allowing a position with flaps extended to 15 degrees, slats 15 degrees, flaps 15 degrees. Consequently, after the accident, the position of the flaps and slats was flaps 15 degrees, slats 15 degrees. The cause of the stall warning after the rotation was not the uncommanded retraction of the flaps slash slats. In fact, if at the time of the beginning of the stall warning, the airplane's angle of attack was lower than 9 degrees, if the flaps slash slats retract, the stall warning is not activated. Stall warning indicates criteria are angle of attack greater than 10 degrees slats retracted or 17,5 degrees slats extended. The aeroplane's angle of attack is greater than 9 degrees. The alpha lock protection prevents the slats from retracting, end quote, meaning that the uncommanded slat retraction would have not happened. Or number three, the deployment of the thrust reverses during takeoff. This is also dangerous, and I quote, There was no deployment of the thrust reverses in flight since they would have had resulted in a change in the engine noise that would have been heard on the CVR and observed on the spectral analysis, end quote. So this did not lead to the stall. So a normal stall, like a quote-unquote normal stall, is scratched out. So the situation that was agreed upon was, and I quote, the architecture of the stall warning is organized so that the stick shaker and the audio warning are set off by the same signal from the FWC. Nothing suggests that the stick shaker was not activated while the alarm was operative. 
The most likely scenario is therefore that there was a false alarm, probably with activation of the stick shaker. The investigation was unable to determine precisely the cause of this false alarm being generated. It could be generated by an anomaly in the aeroplane's speed calculation system, for example, an ADC abnormality. So now we know the situation, or like essentially the reason that these investigators agreed upon. Now they need to know what led to the crash because the quote-unquote stall did not necessarily result in the crash happening because you can still recover from a store so what happened during the ascent and i quote remember that first of samuel is a person who is flying the airplane the airplane did not go above a height of 400 feet and began to descend a short time after the rotation while the engines were delivering takeoff thrust, which shows that as soon as the stall warning appeared, the pilot flying retracted by reducing pitch angle. If in fact the airplane had gone above 400 feet, the first call out heard would have been 400. However, the first height call out from the radio altimeter, 300 feet, appears 12 seconds after takeoff. This indicates that the plane was already descending. The regular callouts of falling height values from 300 feet to 10 feet shows that the aeroplane continued to descend and thus the pilot flying maintained his action on the control column. In the takeoff configuration, a slight nose down altitude is enough to cause the aeroplane to descend. End quote. Meaning the first of Samuli did what he was taught by the airline, the airline being Kenya Airways. And I quote, since we're going to be reading a little bit more now, further, the pilot flying did not apply takeoff or go around thrust, whereas it should have been applied simultaneously with his action on the control column. The procedure was thus only partially applied. The pilot flying should have had various sources of information at his disposal, speed, speed trend bar, engine thrust, etc. that should have made him aware that it was a false alarm. It should, however, be noted that when the master warning was initiated, information on the VSS, the red and black strips, it was not immediately available on the crew's PFD, this being part of the design of the computer. This symbol is only displayed on the PFD 5 seconds after takeoff. Finally, he does not appear to have been aware that his flight path was heading towards the ground. It should be noted that the GPWS was never heard by the pilots. Only a 50 millisecond whoop inaudible to the crew was identified during CVR analysis. The architecture of the airplane in fact creates a hierarchy in the priority given to warnings and their associated alarms. The GPWS warning was masked by the stolen overspeed warnings. So what if there's something wrong with the airplane? That's very suspicious. Our first red flag. So now we know what the pilot who was flying was doing. Captain Muti is not exempt from this, aka the pilot was not flying. And I quote, During the runway acceleration phase, the pilot not flying on that day, the captain, made the expected callouts, thrust, SRS, and runway, then takeoff, power set, 100 knots, V1, and rotate. Immediately on takeoff, he called out positive. Following the callout, the PF answered positive rate of climb gear up. At that moment, the warning sounded, the pilot not flying said, uh-oh, which showed his surprise and he did not retract the gear. The CVR transcript shows that 19 seconds later, the pilot flying asked for the audible warning to be turned off and that the pilot not flying pushed the emergency audio cancel button. No, the, no other action by the pilot not flying was determined until 9 minutes past 9 p.m. 23 seconds when he ordered go up while the radio altimeter had just called out 10 feet and the overspeed VFE, CRC was set off. This go-up order by the pilot not flying shows that he was becoming aware of the proximity of the ground, though only one second before the impact. The radio altimeter 300, 200, 100 call-outs could have led the captain to give this order earlier. He did not appear to have heard them, meaning that Captain Muti he knew what was going on, but he was way too panicked to do anything about it, which is really, really unfortunate. So the final report concludes that the lack of response with Captain Muti was as a result of stress and the fact that they were flying at night increased his spatial disorientation a little bit. 
and I quote, it was not possible to establish if the pilot not flying deliberately interrupted the landing gear retraction sequence or if he was disturbed by the warning. The FCOM states that in the case of an approach to stall with the gear extended, it must only be retracted when the airplane is no longer in a stall situation and there's no longer a risk of ground contact. And can we just mention the fact that there was absolutely no dialogue between the two pilots at this time, which is incredibly weird because usually I think that if there's a situation like that, at least someone must just say something like pull up, increase the rust, I don't know, the nose, something, anything, but these people said nothing, which is incredibly weird. So, to summarize, according to the evidence gathered by the investigation on the training and experience of the members of the flight crew, the commission of inquiry was of the opinion that they were technically qualified and had good experience of flying jet aircraft and the A310 and that they had the necessary training and experience to carry out their tasks safely. End quote. So the findings, there are many findings, there are 10 that I have right now, so I hope you are ready because I know it's a lot. Here we go. Number one, the members of the flight crew of flight KQ431 on 30 January 2000 possessed the ratings and licenses required by the Kenyan regulations and were in accordance with the ICAO standards for the post they held and the route they were flying. All of their ratings and licenses were valid at the time of the accident. Number two, the positions the flight crew members occupied and the tasks that they were carrying out were in accordance with the applicable rules laid down by the relevant Kenyan civil aviation authorities. Number three, the airplane was maintained in accordance with the Kenya Airways A310 maintenance manual approved by the Kenyan civil aviation authorities. Number four, a stall warning activated as soon as the aircraft left the ground. As soon as the warning activated, the post takeoff checklist was stopped. Number five, the pilot flying pushed the control column forward immediately after stick shaker activation and put the aircraft into a descent. Number six, he applied a part of the recovery from the approach to stall procedure recommended by the airline by pushing the control column to stop the stick shaker. Number seven, the crew never applied take off or go around thrust corresponding to 117,5 percent of n1 as recommended by the fcom number eight the captain realized how low the plane was and gave the order to climb one second before the impact and one second is not enough to climb slash to go around number nine the stall warning did not correspond to a true stall situation. The ground proximity warning system were activated but were not generated in the cockpit because they were not prioritized in comparison to the successive stall and overspeed warnings. And number 10, the aeroplane collided with the sea with a slight nose down altitude at a speed increasingly above VFE. The aeroplane's flight path was probably controlled by the crew until the impact with the sea. End quote. So the cause of the crash, the Commission of Inquiry concluded that the cause of the accident of flight KQ431 on 30 January 2000 was a collision with the sea that resulted from the pilot flying applying one part of the procedure by pushing forward on the control column to stop the stick shaker following the initiation of a stall warning on rotation while the airplane was not in a true stall. Contributing causes, they were... The pilot flying's action on the control column put the airplane into a descent without the crew realizing it despite the radio altimeter callouts, the GPWS warnings that could have alerted the crew to an imminent contact with the sea were masked by the priority stalls and overspeed warnings in accordance with the rules of the prioritization of warnings, the conditions for a takeoff performed towards the sea and at night provided no external visual reference that would have allowed the crew to be aware of the direct proximity of the sea end quote so basically that last one was what i was saying all before and i have to say like with the cause of the crash i am very surprised and i'm actually very disappointed because it seems to me that they are putting most of the blame if not all of the blame on first of samuli when it's like he wasn't the only person in the cockpit because there was also captain muti and he essentially was panicking and yes you know we would all do the same thing in that situation however i just don't like the fact that first of samuli is being put 
as like the sole responsible one with the stall and how he handled the stall when it's like there's two pilots in the cockpit for a reason this other pilot is supposed to assist the pilot pilot not flying assist the pilot flying and if first officer muli was handling the pitch of the airplane then captain muti was supposed to handle the thrust of the airplane yet in the final report they are only blaming the first officer so that is incredibly upsetting to me and yes i am mad but i do have to say like before we finish with the recommendations and all of that i do have to say that even though the stall warning was a false stall warning could they have attempted a go around sure if they had communicated cuz captain muti knew what was going on he knew that we're descending but he only said it a second too late i don't know he only said it a second before it happened so I think that is equal responsibility as to what caused the crash and still if there is a sort of malfunction with the airplane then a pilot can still fly an airplane to be honest with you a pilot could still fly an airplane yet like right now I just don't like the fact that they are blaming our first officer over here cuz yes is he partially to blame of course but he is not fully to blame so I know I just had to add that in there The recommendations set out by the EBEA that it as follows civil aviation authorities as training organizations and operators under their authority to integrate into type rating and recurrent training programs for crews of all aircraft likely to be subject to false stall warnings the elements necessary to recognize and manage such a false alarm during phases of flight close to the ground number 2 Consequently the commission of inquiry recommends that the French DGAC ensure that Airbus harmonizes the procedure in the FCOM with those taught during type rating training meaning that the training of pilots when it comes to the Airbus aircraft should always be like standard and should always be the same and number 3 consequently the commission of inquiry recommends that civil aviation authorities responsible for coastal airports or those near water ensure that appropriate equipment aerial maritime etc be put in place as to ensure immediate intervention at an accident site located in an area near coastal airport to make sure that rescuing possible survivors and finding a wrecked cage is easier either way that is the end of today's episode let me know what you think this is going to be i think this is my third last episode of the season of the year is what i meant to say because i think i'm going to end like for the festive season I'm going to end on the 18th so i think the week before christmas um so that you know can make this podcast a little bit better and then i'll return probably like on the 5th on the 8th of january i'll see i'll let you know though but either way that is the end of today's episode let me know what you think tell me on twitter at aci the podcast tell me what you think on instagram at aci underscore the underscore podcast and don't forget to check out our patreon buy me a coffee if you're feeling generous if you can't that's totally okay but thanks so much for listening i've been your host kai jordan and i'll catch you in the next one cheers